This is Tim O'Brien's On the Rainy River uh, from The Things They Carried, a short story or, or chapter within that text. Um, remember that whatever my annotations are, yours should be your own unique uh, conversation with the text. I'm just going to think through the chapter with you. This is one story I've never told before, not to anyone, not to my parents, not to my brother or sister, not even to my wife. To get into it, I've always thought would only cause embarrassment for all of us, a sudden need to be elsewhere, which is a natural response to a confession. So we have all of this stuff here um, that tells us that he's building intimacy with the reader, um, that there's a secret and uh, that we are the first ones to know. So there's, a, um, there's kind of a, a purient interest that builds there. For more than 20 years, I've had to live with it, feeling the shame, trying to push it away. And so by this act of remembrance, by putting the facts down on paper, I'm hoping to relieve at least some of the pressure on my dreams. So here we see um, writing as, a, a, as an act of, um, of cleansing um, a bit, trying to get past that, that sharing that can help to, uh, can help with the cleansing aspect. Oops, and my pen keeps not working, excuse me. Um, but we also have this idea, these kind of natural feelings. It's a hard story to tell. All of us, I suppose, like to believe that in a moral emergency, we will be, behave like the heroes of our youth, bravely and forthrightly, without thought to personal loss or credit. So we do have the idea of stories, that he is dealing with this secret, um, and we know that this is 20 years later, so it's, uh, so it's a dealing with memory um, and retelling this story and kind of cleansing himself. Um, and then he kind of refers to other stories um, that maybe we've heard about heroes, um, the expectations. Certainly, that was my conviction back in the summer of, of 1968. So here's our setting. It's the summer of 1968, which we know is, um, is in um, the Vietnam War era, <clears throat> which we can connect with what we've already read. Tim O'Brien. A secret hero. So here we get our the name of our narrator, um, reminding you that Tim O'Brien narrator is not always the same as Tim O'Brien the author. Um, so considering him as a character here, the narrative character. Um, a secret hero, the Lone Ranger. If the stakes ever became high enough, if the evil were ever were evil enough, if the good were good enough, I would simply tap a secret reservoir of courage that had been accumulating inside me over the years. So we've got this um, parallel structure that he's playing with. Um, evil were evil enough, good were good enough. Um, and then this idea that, um, that courage, that the stories that he's heard say that, uh, that the courage is going to be there. Courage, I seemed to think, comes to us in finite quantities, like an inheritance. And by being frugal and stashing it away and letting it earn interest, we steadily increase our moral capital in the preparation for the day when the account must be drawn down. So this is one idea about courage, is that we only have a certain amount um, of it. Uh, and we'll consider that as an idea that he's playing with here. It was a comforting theory. It dispensed, with, uh, it dispensed with all those bothersome little acts of daily courage. It offered hope and grace to the repetitive coward. It justified the past while amortizing the future. So here, this might give us a little bit of insight into how he has acted, um, that he might not always have, uh, that he may have been a coward um, in those daily acts. Um, but that knowing that, oh, I'll just use that courage later. That's why I'm not being brave now. In June of 1968, a month after graduating from McAllister College, I was drafted to fight a war I hated. So here we've got a conflict, right? Is he's drafted and he doesn't want to go. I was 21 years old. Young, yes, and politically naive. But even so, the American war in Vietnam seemed to me wrong. So we've got this idea of the wrongness of the war. And in, uh, in looking back at it, we see a lot of people protesting the war and the wrongness of Vietnam. Um, and so we're wondering if this is him, uh, him at the moment or looking back. Um, certain blood was being shed for uncertain reasons. Um, that idea of certain and uncertain uh, in, in contrast there. I saw no unity of purpose, no consensus on matters of philosophy or history or law. 
Um, we've got a tiny bit of polysyndet in there. The very fact, well, the very facts were shrouded in uncertainty. Was it a civil war, a war of national, natu I'm sorry, national liberation, or simple aggression? Who started it, and when, and why? What really happened on the U to the USS Maddox on that dark night in the Gulf of Tonkin? Who was, uh, I'm sorry, um, was, she, was Ho Chi Minh a communist stooge or a nationalist savior or both or neither? What about, General, what about the Geneva Accords? What about CETO and the Cold War? What about dominoes? Um, so he's giving us a whole series of questions um, that we know are historical questions um, that, uh, that we may still be asking in our history classes and having as conversations now. America was divided on these and a thousand other issues, and the debate had spilled out across the floor of the United States Senate and into the streets. Um, good imagery here, um, the spilling across the floor. And smart men in pinstripes could not agree even on the most fundamental matters of public policy. The only certainty that summer was moral confusion. Ah, isn't that a beautiful paradox that certainty is moral confusion? It was my view then, and still is, that you don't make war without knowing why. Um, and this is an interesting, so we've got, uh, we've got this idea about war that we're also considering is when, you know, when is war justified? Um, how does one know uh, whether or not to go to war? Knowledge, of course, is always imperfect. But it seemed to me that when a nation goes to war, it must have reasonable confidence in the justice and imperative uh, of its cause. You can't fix your mistakes. Once people are dead, you can't make them undead. So he's dealing with the stakes of war um, and kind of contrasting them with these smart men in pinstripes, which seems a little bit um, sarcastic there, that they get to make these ideas when there are people whose lives are on the line. In any case, those were my convictions. And back in college, I had taken a modest stand against the war. Notice that it's a modest stand. He's not, uh, not necessarily a vehement anti-war um, person. Nothing radical, no hot-headed stuff. Just ringing a few doorbells for Jean McCarthy, composing a few tedious, uninspired editorials for the campus newspaper. Oddly, though, it was almost entirely an, enter an intellectual activity. Um, so this is not a physical activity, but just one that uh, kind of playing over ideas in mind. I brought some energy to it, of course, but it was the energy that, uh, that accompanies almost any abstract endeavor. I felt no personal danger. I felt no sense of impending crisis in my life. So this idea, this anaphora here, um, is getting us to his feelings, um, which are in contrast to the intellect that was before. Stupidly, with a kind of smug reproval that I can't begin to fathom, I assumed that the problems of killing and dying did not fall within my special province. So he's removed from this idea. He can think about it and kind of have his own, uh, um, his own removed feelings um, because he's not involved. The draft notice arrived on June 17th, 1968. It was a humid afternoon, I remember, cloudy and very quiet. So we've got setting. Um, and, and I'd just come in from a round of golf. So we've got this idea of relaxation when it comes to golf and kind of just daily activity. My mother and father were having lunch out in the kitchen. I remember opening the letter, scanning the first few lines, feeling the blood go thick behind my eyes. Really nice imagery there, um, of, uh, of kind of fogginess. I remember a sound in my head. So again, we've got this idea of memory and thinking, uh, thinking back to the fact that this is a story that he's using in order to, um, to cleanse and reconcile with this idea. I remember a sound in my head. It wasn't thinking, just a silent howl, a million things all at once. I was too good for this war, too smart, too compassionate, too everything. It couldn't happen. I was above it. I had the world dicked. Phi Beta Kappa and summa cum laude and president of the, uni of the student body and a full ride scholarship for grad studies at Harvard. Um, so again, he's giving his credentials why he's too good for this. A mistake maybe, a foul up in the paperwork. I was no soldier. Simple declarative sentence. I hated Boy Scouts. I hated camping out. I hated dirt and tents and... I'm not going... 
and mosquitoes. So again, we've got the, um, the anaphora there of, of what he hates and, what, uh, and how that's tied to war. The sight of blood made me queasy, and I couldn't tolerate authority, and I didn't know a rifle from a slingshot. I was a liberal for Christ's sake. So now we've got um, we've got identity on the line. If they needed fresh bodies, why not draft some back to the Stone Age hawk? So we've got some uh, some uh, a little bit of name calling there, a little bit of of me versus them, us versus them, and dividing. Uh, that's not me, the person who who desperately wants that. The idea of doves and hawks, um, pro peace or pro war. Or some dumb jingo in his hard hat and bomb, bomb Hanoi button. Or one of LBJ's pretty daughters or Westmoreland's whole handsome family. Nephews and nieces and baby grandsons. So this idea of the people who are promoting war and their families, um, that since they're promoting the war, that somehow their, um, their families should be involved. There should be a law, I thought. If you support a war, if you think it's worth the price, that's fine. But you have to put your own precious fluids on the line. This is beautiful. It's not blood because blood has a different uh, connotation. This makes you think of like the embalming table. Um, it's a lot ickier than just uh, than just maybe dying and stuff like that. It gets a little a lot more concrete. You have to head for the front and hook up with an infantry unit and help spill the blood. Um, so this idea of um, those pinstriped men being removed from this, the people who are making the decisions. And you have to bring along your wife or your kids or your lover. A law, I thought. I remember the rage in my stomach. So we've got that I remember again. Later, it burned down to a smoldering self-pity, then to numbness. At dinner that night, my father asked what my plans were. Nothing, I said. Wait. Um, so we've got some seeming indecision. I spent the summer of 1968 working at an armor, armor meatpacking plant in my hometown of Worthington, Minnesota. So we've got more concrete uh, um, setting there. The plant specialized in pork products, and for eight hours a day, I stood on a quarter-mile assembly line. More properly, a disassembly line. Oh, that's beautiful, isn't it? Taking things apart instead of putting things together. Removing blood clots from the necks of dead pigs. My job title, I believe, was declotter. After slaughter, the hogs were decapitated, split down the length of the belly, pried open, eviscerated, and strung up by the hind hocks on a conveyor belt. So we've got some real concrete detail um, regarding his job here, and we might want to consider why is he giving us all of these details? Um, what does it have to do with the conflict that he's experiencing about war? Um, and what's the connection there? Then gravity took over. By the time the carcass reached my spot on the line, the fluids had mostly drained out, everything except for dense clots of blood in the neck and upper chest cavity. To remove the stuff, I used a kind of water gun. So we've got this idea of gun, um, which is a war word. Um, so we might be connecting at that point. We've got the idea of blood um, and guns. Um, so we might be connecting that to his feelings about war. The machine was heavy, maybe 80 pounds. And after we've read that first chapter, we're thinking about um, the things they carried in war, right? And was suspended from the ceiling by a thick rubber cord. There was some bounce to it, an elastic up and down give. And the trick was to maneuver the gun with your whole body, not lifting with your arms, just letting the rubber cord do the work for you. At one end was a trigger and the, uh, and the muzzle end was a small nozzle uh, and a steel roller brush. As the carcass passed by, you'd lean forward and swing the gun up against the clots and squeeze the trigger, all in one motion, and the brush would whirl and the water would come shooting out and you'd have, hear a quick splattering sound as the clots dissolved into a thin red mist. Um, and so we've got that, I, that kind of bloody, um, gross imagery um, that uh, kind of turns the stomach. It was not pleasant work. Goggles were a necessity and a rubber apron, but even so, it was like standing for eight hours a day under a lukewarm blood shower. At night, I'd go home smelling of pig. Um, so we've got another sense here. We've got the feel, the warm shower, we, then we've got the smell. Um, we've gotten some visual imagery. It wouldn't go away. Even after a hot bath, scrubbing hard, the stink was always there, like old bacon or sausage, a greasy pig stink that soaked deep into my skin and hair. Um, so something that you can't get rid of. 
Among other things I remember, it was tough getting dates that summer. Surprise, surprise. I felt isolated. I spent a lot of time alone. There was also that draft notice that tucked away in my wallet. So we've got this, uh, we've got this ending um, that gets us back to the point. In the evenings, I'd sometimes borrow my father's car and drive aimlessly around town, feeling sorry for myself, thinking about the war in the pig factory and how my life seemed to be collapsing towards slaughter. Uh, that's beautiful because we've got that, uh, we've got two different meanings there towards slaughter of going to war and uh, the slaughter of the pigs. I felt paralyzed. All around me, the options seemed to be narrowing. Um, so we've got the idea of options here. He's been drafted, um, but he can't move. He doesn't know what to do. Um, the options seem to be narrowing. As if I were hurtling down a huge black funnel, the whole world squeezing in tight. Again, good imagery there. There was no happy way out. Um, this is really important because it really gives a, a concrete idea of the conflict that there's no right answer here um, in this thing that he has shame about. The government had ended most graduate school deferments. The waiting lists for the National Guard and Reserves were impossibly long. So he's thinking about ways to get out of the draft. These are, these are legit um, ways to not be in the draft. It used to be if you were in graduate school um, that you could uh, have a deferment from the draft and they wouldn't pull you in because you were too essential and all of these other reasons maybe, but they're, they've kind of gotten rid of those or you could go into the, you could choose to go in some other, some other places, but these don't seem to be options anymore. My health was solid. I didn't qualify for CO status. No religions. That's conscientious objector. Um, I'm not sure I'm spelling that right. Um, so that's somebody who, um, who absolutely does not, uh, who feels strongly about war, but you have to be able to prove that and have a history of it, not just decide that once, uh, once you've been drafted. Uh, no religious grounds, no history as a pacifist. Moreover, I could not be, uh, I could not claim to be opposed to the war as a matter of general, to war as a matter of general principle. There were occasions, I believed, when the nation was justified in using military force to achieve its ends, to stop a Hitler or some comparable evil. And I told myself that in such circumstances, I would have willingly marched off to battle. This is beautiful because it deals with history and hindsight. Um, if you think uh, historically back to World War II, the U.S. did not get involved. Nobody wanted involvement for a long time um, because it seemed like it wasn't justified, that wasn't something that was um, concretely important. But when we look back on it, it's easy to see the right and wrong of that. Um, so the idea of having perspective, historical perspective versus having to make a decision in the moment um, is, a really, is really a challenging thing. The problem, though, was that a draft board did not let you choose your war. Um, you get drafted and you have to go. Beyond all this, or at the very center, was the raw fact of terror. I did not want to die. So we've got these ideological reasons, but then we've got the more concrete fear. Not ever, but certainly not then, not there, not in a wrong war. Driving up Main Street, past the courthouses and the Ben Franklin store, I sometimes felt the fear spreading inside me like weeds. Um, so again, we've got the, uh, the, the fear and then a concrete imagery. I imagined myself dead. I imagined myself doing things I could not do, changing an enemy position, taking aim at another human being. Um, I love this, that imagining something that you could not do, um, but people did anyway. At some point in mid-July, I began thinking seriously about Canada. So this is the idea. Canada is a way to dodge the draft. Um, where you run away, you cross the border, and it's illegal, um, and you essentially give up your citizenship. Um, if you come back, you'll be arrested. And it wasn't until, um, oh, good golly, it was decades later that they actually pardoned the people who had uh, dodged the draft to Canada so they could finally come back. The border lay a few hundred miles north, an eight-hour drive. Both my conscience and my instincts were telling me to make a break for it. Just take off and run like hell and never stop. So we've got an agreement between conscience and instincts is to go. Okay, so there seems to be, um, so then we're wondering what's keeping him here then. Um, if conscience and instincts are telling you to go, that seems like the right thing to do. In the beginning, the idea seemed purely abstract. The word can 
printing itself out in my head, but after a time I could see particular shapes and images, the sorry details of my own future, a hotel room in Winnipeg, a battered old suitcase, my father's eyes as I tried to explain it over the telephone. So here we get the concrete. Now we're starting to see not the conscience and the instinct, but the emotion and that shame potentially that, uh, that we dealt with. I could almost hear his voice and my mother's. Run, I'd think. Then I'd think impossible. Then a second later, I'd think run. So here we have a concrete um, conflict back and forth, not sure what to do. It was a moral split. I couldn't make up my mind. I feared the war, yes, but I also feared exile. So here are the conflicting ideas. Um, war and exile, which one is worse? Is uh, It's kind of uh, the choice between two terrible things there, um, Tzil and Charybdis, um, the rock and the hard place, essentially. I was afraid of walking away from my own life, my friends and my family, my whole history, everything that mattered to me. I feared losing the respect of my parents. Notice the anaphora here, um, the idea of uh, of what I feared. Um, I, here it's, it's I was afraid, but we've got I feared, I feared, I feared, I feared. Um, I feared losing the respect of my parents. I feared the law. I feared ridicule and censure. My hometown was a conservative little spot on the, pra on the prairie, a place where tradition counted. And it was easy to imagine people sitting around uh, a table down at the old Gobbler Cafe on Main Street, coffee cups poised, the conversation slowly zeroing in on the young O'Brien kid, how the damned sissy had taken off for Canada. So now we've got some name calling and what he thinks he'll be called that would be particularly um, hurtful. Um, all of those uh, those ideas of being yellow, being a sissy um, kind of come up here. At night, when I couldn't sleep, I'd sometimes carry on, a, carry on fierce arguments with those people. So the idea of, again, like the, the not reality, um, not actually having these conversations, but the conversations that we have in our head um, that go into who we think we are versus who we, what we actually do and what we actually say. I'd be screaming at them, telling them how much I detested their blind, thoughtless, automatic acquiescence to it all. Their simple-minded patriotism, um, because he thinks it's more, uh, more complicated, or is it just fear of, of dying? Their prideful ignorance, their love-it-or-leave-it platitudes, how they were sending me off to fight in a war they didn't understand and didn't want to understand. I held them responsible. By God, yes, I did, all of them. I held them personally and individually responsible. The polyester Kiwanis boys, the merchants and farmers, the pious churchgoers, the chatty housewives, the PTA and Lions Clubs, and the veterans of the foreign, foreign wars and the fine upstanding gentry out at the country club. They didn't know bow die from the man in the moon. They didn't know history. Um, so here's the problem with these people is that they don't know history. Um, and we're wondering maybe does he understand history? Um, or is he kind of looking with that historical lens that, uh, that makes everything better? They didn't know the first thing about Diem's t uh, tyranny or the nature of, of Vietnamese nationalism or, lo or the long colonialism of the French. This was all too damned complicated. It required some reading, but no matter. It was a war to stop the communists, plain and simple which was how they liked these things. And you were, treason, you were a treasonous pussy if you, if you had second thoughts about uh, killing or dying for plain and simple reasons. So again, we've got that name calling and we've got a juxtaposition between the really complicated ideas of war um, against the simple um, patriotism and, uh, um, and, and, and ideology that seems so black and white. Um, so considering the, the things that seem simple that actually have a lot more compli uh, complicated things in them. I was bitter, sure. But it was, but it was so much more than that. The emotions went from rage to terror to bewilderment to sorrow to guilt to sorrow and then back again to outrage. I felt sickness inside me, real disease. So here, comparison to something that uh, that will kill you, um, something that's deadly, um, and that might be the case for war, but also for this indecision um, that he's experiencing. 
Most of this I've told before, at least hinted at, but what I have never, never told is the full truth. So here we get, we go back to that beginning of that secret, what he's never told and the shame that the stuff uh, that we've already heard, that's not the bad stuff. The bad stuff is still to come. So again, um, wetting our appetites for that. How I cracked. How at work one morning, standing on the pig line, I felt something break open in my chest. I don't know what it was. I know, I, I'll never know. But it was real. I know that much. It was a physical rupture, a, cr a cracking, leaking, popping feeling, um, which kind of goes along with the pig stuff, doesn't it? I remember dropping my water gun quickly, almost without thought. I took off my apron and walked out of the plant and drove home. It was mid-morning, I remember, and the house was empty. Down in my chest, there was still that leaking sensation. Um, that, that goes along with death, right? Something very warm and precious spilling out, those precious fluids from before. And I was covered with blood and hog stink, and for a long while, I just concentrated on holding myself together. I remember taking a hot shower, and he's already told us that that doesn't help. Um, so that's not gonna, um, probably not gonna be helpful here. I remember packing a suitcase and carrying it out to the kitchen, standing very still for a few minutes, looking carefully at the familiar objects around me. The old chrome toaster, the telephone, the pink and white forma formica on the kitchen counters. So here, this is almost like taking a picture to get those details, right? And so, so that you can remember them. The room was full of bright sunshine. Everything sparkled. My house, I thought. My life. I'm not sure how long I stood there, but later I scribbled out a short note to my parents. What it said exactly, I don't recall now. Something vague, taking off, we'll call, loved him. I drove north. So here we've got the contrast of things that he does remember versus what he doesn't remember. Again, uh, um, a juxtaposition there um, of how memory plays, uh, plays tricks and what actually gets solidified in there and what doesn't. I drove north. It's a blur now, as it was then, and I remember, all I remember is velocity and the feeling of the steering wheel in my hands. I was riding on adrenaline. Um, so here, we've got, we go back to that instinct, right? Fight or flight um, that he seems to be going with. A giddy feeling, in a way, except there was the dreamy edge of impossibility to it, like running a dead-end maze. No way out. It couldn't come to a happy conclusion, and yet I was doing it anyway because it was all I could think of to do. It was pure flight fast and mindless, and I had no plan. Just hit the border at high speed and crash through and keep on running. Um, so this idea of no plan um, goes back to that instinct, right? Near dusk, I passed through uh, Bemidji, then turned northeast toward International Falls. I spent the night in the car be be behind a closed down gas station a half a mile from the border. In the morning, after gassing up, I headed straight west along the rainy river. So now we're to um, the title of the chapter, which separates Minnesota from Canada. So we've got the idea now that the rainy river is a border um, that separates war from not war. Uh, and, for, and which for me separated one life from another. The land was mostly wilderness. So here he's giving us some pretty concrete details about how the decision feels uh, through setting. Um, so he feels like he's in the wilderness and that's where the decision is taking place. Here and there, I passed a motel or bait shop, but otherwise the country unfolded in great sweeps of pine and birch and sumac. Although it was still August, the air already had the smell of October. Football season, piles of red and yellow leaves, everything crisp and clean. So th this is a really nostalgic um, way to consider things. Uh, I remember a huge blue sky. Um, so we've got that I remember again. Off to my right was the Rainy River. Wide as a lake in places and, and beyond the Rainy River was Canada. For a while, I just drove, not aiming at anything. Then, late in the morning, I began looking for a place to lie low for a day or two. Ah, so plans have changed. Um, he, he was just going to get there um, and, cr and just crash through the border and keep on going. Now, he wants to lay low for a day or two. I was exhausted and scared sick. And around noon, I pulled into an old fishing resort called the Tip Top Lodge. Actually, it was not a lodge at all, just eight or nine tiny yellow cabins clustered on a peninsula that jutted northward into the rainy river. The place was in sorry shape. There was a dangerous wooden dock, an old minnow tank, a flimsy tar paper boathouse along the shore. The main building, which stood in a cluster of pines on high ground, seemed to lean heavily to one side, like a cripple, the roof sagging toward Canada. 
Ooh, so we've got even the roof sagging toward Canada. So we've got another kind of directionality, kind of pushing toward that direction. Briefly, I thought about turning around, just giving up. Um, so turning around and going back home is giving up. Um, but then I got out of the car and walked up to the front porch. The man who opened the door that day is the hero of my life. So here we've got another character um, that he's calling a hero. And so he's thinking, uh, this might make us think back to the courage stuff that he was talking about at the beginning of the chapter. How do I say this without sounding sappy? Um, so again, he's uh, here he's thinking about the storytelling um, and how does that come off since this is the first time in theory he's telling this. Blurt it out. The man, sa the man saved me. He offered exactly what I needed without questions, without any words at all. He took me in. So here we're figuring out how is he a hero and how was he, Tim, Tim O'Brien saved? He was there at a critical time, a silent, watchful presence. Six days, so here he's not giving us any action um, for heroic, um, but instead giving us the fact that he's not doing anything and that somehow is the heroic thing six days later when it ended um beautiful use of the word it um because there really is no concrete antecedent um we have to infer what it is this kind of indecision this uh this staying at the lodge i was unable to find a proper way to thank him and i never have and so if nothing else this story represents a small gesture of gratitude 20 years overdue even after two decades, I can, st I can close my eyes and return to that porch at the Tip Top Lodge. So we've got the idea of memory here. I can see the old guy staring at me. Elroy Burdall, 81 years old, skinny and shrunken and mostly bald. He wore uh, not typically um, a hero, not the way that you would typically picture a hero. He wore a flannel shirt and brown work pants. In one hand, I remember he carried a green apple, a small paring knife in the other. His eyes had the bluish gray color of a razor blade. That is a really interesting um, and unexpected um, imagery. Um, so this idea of a razor, the color of the razor uh, might pop out to uh, at us. Um, and so his, uh, the, his eyes tend uh, are, are the thing that we're focusing on now. The same polished shine as he peered up at me. I felt a strange sharpness. So again, that razor blade and sharp. So he's kind of cutting open everything with his eyes. Almost painful, a cutting sensation, as if his gaze were somehow slicing me open. In part, no doubt, it was my own sense of guilt. So this idea of um, reality versus uh, how, how we feel things are happening. But even so, I'm absolutely certain that the old man took one look and went right to the heart of things. A kid in trouble. Okay, so this is when everything else is taken away. This is what he is at that moment, is a kid in trouble. When I asked for a room, Elroy made a little clicking sound with his tongue. He nodded, led me to one of the cabins, and dropped a key in my hand. I remember smiling at him. I also remember wishing I hadn't. Um, that's interesting that he wishes he hadn't smiled. Um, maybe uh, so we're thinking, why might that be awkward? Is it the person? Is it the, um, is it the circumstances? The old man shook his head uh, as if to tell me it wasn't worth the bother. Dinner at 5.30, he said. You eat fish? Anything, I said. Elroy grunted and said, I'll bet. We spent six days together at the Tip Top Lodge, just the two of us. Tourist season was over and there were no boats on the river. And the great wilderness seemed to withdraw into great permanent stillness. So here we've got some of that concrete setting um, that's creating a particular mood for us. Um, which is, I've just lost my pen. Over those six days, Elroy Burdall and I took most of our meals together. In the mornings, we sometimes went out on long hikes in the woods, and at night we played Scrabble or listened to records or sat reading in front of his big stone fireplace. So here we've got this idea of, um, of uh, kind of feeling like home, that there isn't necessarily that um, all of that trouble, all of that indecision is kind of being pushed back, just, uh, just going through the days uh, in a comfortable way. At times, I felt the awkwardness of an intruder, but Elroy accepted me into his quiet routine without fuss or ceremony. He took my presence for granted, the same way he might have sheltered a stray cat. Ah, uh, um, good comparison. No wasted sighs or pity, and there was never any talk about it. 
Just the opposite. What I remember more than anything is the man's willful, almost ferocious silence. Um, so kind of forcing him to, to have his own time. In all that time together, in all those hours, he never asked the obvious questions. Why was I there? Why alone? Why, pre- why so preoccupied? If Elroy was curious about any of this, he was careful never to put it into words. So here we've got this idea of, uh, of a choice not to ask. My hunch, though, is that he already knew. At least the basics. After all, it was 1968, and guys were burning draft cards, and Canada was just a boat ride away. Elroy Burdall was no hick. Um, even though, so he was kind of, dis- his description was kind of, you know, in his flannel and stuff like that. Um, but uh, this, uh, the word hick is, is derogatory, and so we want to make sure that uh, he gets pulled out of that uh, bucket. The people who are blindly patriotic. His bedroom, I remember, was cluttered with books and newspapers. So he does read, um, interestingly, right? Um, Contrast to those people who don't uh, read back home. And they don't know. Uh, He killed me at the Scrabble board, barely concentrating. And on those occasions when speech was necessary, he had a way of compressing large thoughts into small cryptic packets of language. One evening, just at sunset, he pointed up at the up at an owl howling over the uh, cir- I'm sorry, circling over the violet lighted forest to the west. Hey O'Brien, he said, "There's Jesus." This is interesting. We've got this idea. We've got uh, allusion to um, to to God and Savior, etc. Um, that is this owl. The man was sharp. He didn't miss much. Those razor eyes. Now and then, he'd catch me staring out at the river, the far shore, and I could almost hear the tumblers clicking in his head. Maybe I'm wrong, but I doubt it. One thing's for certain. Uh, He knew I was in desperate trouble, and he knew I couldn't talk about it. Um, This is a, a nice word that he couldn't talk about it. Not that he won't, he just can't. The wrong word, or even the right word, and I would have disappeared. So here we get the purpose for all of that not talking. I was wired and jittery. My skin felt too tight. After supper one evening, I vomited and went back to my cabin and lay down for a few moments and then vomited again. Another time, in the middle of the night, in the uh, middle of the afternoon, I began sweating and couldn't shut it off. So again, we've got this idea of that disease. I went through whole days feeling dizzy with sorrow. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't lie still. At night, I'd toss around in bed, half awake, half dreaming, imagining how I'd sneak down to the beach and quietly push one of the old man's boats out to the river and start paddling my way toward Canada. So here we've got a vague plan. There were times when I thought I'd gone off the psychic edge, Um, gone crazy there. I couldn't tell up from down. I was just falling, and late in the night, I'd lie there watching watching bizarre pictures spin through my head getting chased by the border patrol, helicopters and searchlights and barking dogs. I'd be crashing through the woods. I'd be down on my hands and knees, people shouting out my name, law closing in on all sides, my hometown draft board, the FBI and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Um, So again, we've got this kind of fear and this building of a picture of what that might look like. It all seemed crazy and impossible. 21 years old, an ordinary kid with all the ordinary dreams and ambitions. And all I wanted was to live the life I was born to. Um, I love this. Um, a mainstream life. I loved baseball and hamburgers and cherry cokes, and now I was on the margins of exile. So this is a very American kind of view, um, and the idea of uh, of exile, having to go and fight for one's country, uh, being a form of exile, leaving my country forever, and it seemed so grotesque and terrible and sad. I'm not sure how I made it through those six days. Most of it I can't remember. Um, so again, that idea of memory um, and coming back to it. One, on two or three afternoons to pass some time, I helped Elroy get the place ready for winter, sweeping down the cabins and hauling in the boats, little chores that kept my body moving. Um, that idea of movement being important because he, he's just spinning in his mind. The days were cool and bright. The nights were very dark. One morning, the old man showed me how to split and stack firewood, and for several hours, we just worked in silence out behind his house. At one point, I remember, Elroy brought brought down his maul and looked at me for a long time, his lips drawn as if framing a difficult question. But then he shook his head and went back to work. Again, that idea of a choice of silence. The man's self-control was amazing. So here he probably wants to ask, but he recognizes that it would be bad to do that. 
He never pried. He never put me in a position that required lies or denials because that's what he, Tim, Tim O'Brien would do at that moment. To an extent, I suppose, his reticence was typical of that part of Minnesota where privacy still held value. And even if I'd been walking around with some horrible deformity, four arms and three heads, I'm sure the old man would have talked about everything except those extra arms and heads. Simple politeness was part of it. But even more than that, I think, the man understood that words were insufficient, um, that something here is really, really big, and that words don't do it justice. The problem had gone beyond discussion. During that long summer, I'd been over and over the various arguments, all the pros and cons, and it was no longer a question that could be decided by an act of pure reason. So this idea of, you know, pros and cons lists that, um, that at some point, um, they're not helpful anymore. Intellect had come up against emotion. Okay, so then we've got that idea of, uh, of, of where his instinct and intellect was telling him to do versus that emotion. My conscience told me to run, and there's that conscience again. But some irrational and powerful force was resisting, so we've got to think about what this force is. Like a weight pushing, uh, pushing me toward the war. What it came down to, stupidly, was a sense of shame. Hot, stupid shame. I did not want people to think badly of me. Not my parents, not my brother or sister, not even the folks down at the Gobbler Cafe, people that he has uh, kind of disparaged, and yet he doesn't want them to think poorly of him. I was ashamed to be there at the Tip Top Lodge. I was ashamed of my conscience, ashamed to be doing the right thing. Um, notice the repetition of that word. Some of this Elroy must have understood, not the details, of course, but the plain fact of crisis, and that's all that matters. Although the old man never confronted me about it, there, were, there was one occasion when he came close to forcing the whole thing out into the open. It was early evening and we'd just finished supper, and over coffee and dessert I asked him about my bill, how much I owed so far. For a long while, the old man squinted down at the tablecloth. So here, again, that kind of quiet in, uh, quietness where he's not talking his way through it, but rather letting the silence uh, be there until he can figure out what to do. Well... The basic rate, he said, is 50 bucks a night, not counting meals. This makes four nights, right? I nodded. I had $312 in my wallet. Elroy kept his eyes on the tablecloth. Now, that's an on-season price. To be fair, I suppose we should knock it down a peg or two. He leaned back in the chair. What's a reasonable number, you figure? I don't know. I said 40. 40 is good. 40 a night. Then we tack on food. Say another 100? 260 total? So we're getting the math here. I guess. He raised his eyebrows. Too much? No, that's fair. It's fine. Tomorrow, though. I think I'd better take off tomorrow. So this idea of, of money being prohibitive, that he can't sit there, uh, can't stay forever. Elroy shrugged and began clearing the table. For a time, he fussed with the dishes, whistling to himself as if the subject had been settled. After a second, he slapped his hands together. You know what we forgot, he said? We forgot wages. Those odd jobs you've done. What we have to do, we have to figure out what your time's worth. Uh, your last job, how much did you pull in an hour? Not enough, I said. Bad one? Yes, pretty bad. So the, here we've got the going back to that big factory, right? Slowly then, without intending any long ser sermon, I told him about my days at the pig plant. It began as a straight recitation of the fact, but before I could stop myself, I was talking about the blood clots and the water gun and how the smell had soaked into my skin and how I couldn't wash it away. Um, so we've got that polysyndetin there. Um, that uh, that kind of compounds and makes it uh, makes it more emotionally um, taxing. It went on for a long time. I told him about wild hogs squealing in my dreams, the sounds of butchery, slaughterhouse sounds, and sometimes I'd wake up with that greasy pig stink in my throat. When I was finished, Elroy nodded at me. Well, to be honest, he said, when you first showed up here, I wondered about all that. The aroma, I mean, smelled like you were awfully fond of pork chops. The old man almost smiled. So again, that was something that he hadn't said that now um, can come out. Um, so clearly the old man is thinking and, and drawing conclusions. The old man almost smiled. He made a snuffing sound, then sat down with a pencil and a piece of paper. So what'd this crud, crud job pay? 10 bucks an hour, 15? Less. Elroy shook his head. Let's make it 15. Um, which, which in 1968, that's a lot of money, right? Like even now, the minimum wage is far below that. Um, and so, uh, so recognizing that that would be actually a pretty extraordinary sum. 
You put in 25 hours here, easy. That's 375 bucks total wages. We subtract the 260 for food and lodging, and I still owe you 115. He took four fifties out of his shirt pocket and laid them on the table. So he has just switched the entire conversation um, and negated this need to leave because now he owes him money. Um, call it even, he said. No, pick it up, get yourself a haircut. The money lay on the table for the rest of the evening. It was still there when I went back to my cabin. In the morning, I found an envelope tacked to my door, inside with the 450s and a two-word note that said, emergency fund. So he's leaving him an out there. The man knew. Looking back after 20 years, I sometimes wonder if the events of that summer didn't happen in some other dimension, a place where your life exists before you've lived it, where it goes afterward. None of it's ever seemed real. During my time at the Tip Top Lodge, I had the feeling that I'd slipped out of my own skin, hovering a few feet away while some poor yo-yo with my name and face tried to make his way toward a future he didn't understand and didn't want. So we got this kind of out-of-body experience going on um, in memory. Even now, I can see myself as I was then. It's like watching an old home movie. I'm young and tan and fit. I've got hair, lots of it. I don't smoke or drink. I'm wearing faded blue jeans and a white polo shirt. I can see myself sitting on Elroy Burdall's dock near, near dusk one evening. The eye of the sky, a bright shimmering pink. And I'm finishing up a letter to my parents that tells, uh, tells what I'm about to do and why I'm doing it and how sorry I am that I never found the courage to talk to them about it. I ask them not to be angry. So here we've got the idea of forgiveness uh, and the idea of the, the fear and the shame um, of running away that he's trying to deal with. I ask them not to be angry. I try, so, so here it seems like, uh, like this indicates a particular um, decision, right? What I'm about to do, uh, which would be get going to Canada if he has to apologize for it. I try to explain some of my feelings, but there aren't enough words. And so I just say that it's a thing that has to be done. At the end of the letter, I talk about the vacations we used to take up into this North Country at a place called Whitefish Lake and how the scenery here reminds me of those good times. I tell them I'm fine. I tell them I'll write again from Winnipeg or Montreal or wherever I ended up. On my last full day, the sixth day, the old man took me out fishing on the Rainy River. So now we're closer to Canada than we've ever been. We're actually on the Rainy River. The afternoon was sunny and cold. Um, and so here we definitely want to focus on the setting and the mood that it's creating. A stiff breeze came from the north, and I remember how, uh, how the little 15-foot boat, boat made sharp rocking motions as we pushed off from the dock. The current was fast. All around us, um, there was a vastness to the world, an unpeopled rawness, just the tree and the sky and the water reaching out toward nowhere. The air had the brittle set of, scent of October, so we've got that October scent again, but we've got some more concrete things about um, the river, that the current was fast, that it kind of carries you on with it, or that you can't necessarily fight it is, is the implication there. For 10 or 15 minutes, Elroy held a course upstream. The river was choppy and silver gray. Then he turned straight north and put the engine on full throttle. So north is Canada, right? Um, and so he is, he's going fast up toward Canada. I felt the bow lift beneath me. I remember the wind in my ears, the sound of the old outboard Evan Rood, that's the engine. For a time, I didn't pay attention to anything, just the feeling of cold spray that, uh, against my face. But then it occurred to me that at some point we must have passed into Canadian waters, across that dotted line between two different worlds. And I remember a sudden tightening in my chest as I looked up and watched the far shore come at me. So here we've got this, uh, this uh, dotted line, the idea of boundaries um, that you can't see. Um, and kind of crossing those boundaries without knowing you've crossed them exactly where, but that there's a feeling to it. This wasn't a daydream. It was tangible and real. As we came in toward land, Elroy cut the engine, letting the boat fish tail lightly about 20 yards offshore. The old man didn't look at me or speak. Bending down, he opened up his tackle box and busied himself with a bobber and a piece of wire leader, humming to himself, his eyes down. It struck me that he must have planned it. I'll never be certain, of course, but I think he meant to bring me up against these realities. So forcing him into a decision to guide me across the river and take me to the edge and to stand a kind of vigil as I chose a life for myself. Um, so again, bringing him to the choice. 
um, not making a choice for him, but bringing him to the choice so that Tim O'Brien can make his own choice. I remember staring at the old man and then at my hands and then at Canada. The shoreline was, was dense with brush and timber. I could see tiny red berries on the bushes. I could see a squirrel up in one of the birch trees, a big crow looking at me from a boulder along the river. So we're bringing in animals here, right? And, uh, and, and, uh, and concrete uh, natural images, the detail there that he's able to see. That close, 20 yards, and I could see the delicate latticework of the leaves, the texture of the soil, the browned needles beneath the pines, the configurations of geology and human history. Um, and so this comes back. There aren't humans there, but yet this idea of border um, and this idea of escape is very, very much a part of human history. 20 yards. I could have done it. I could have jumped and started swimming for my life. So notice the word could have, right? Inside me, in my chest, I felt a terrible squeezing pressure, kind of like those, those uh, the pig guns, right? The, um, the declotting uh, guns. Even now, as I write this, I can, uh, can still feel that tightness. And I want you to feel it. Um, so now he is talking directly to the reader. Um, so he is asking us to try to understand and put ourselves in that position. Um, it's not just about Tim O'Brien anymore. Now it's about us. He wants us to be in that position, um, not just kind of remotely thinking about what it might be, but to actually put yourself in that, in that uh, position and make the choice. The wind coming off the river, the waves, the silence, the wooded frontier. So we've got that, uh, that ace into Tim to kind of to give us all of the lists um and it kind of automatically includes all of the things that that he's experienced before you're at the brow bow of the boat on the rainy river you're 21 years old you're scared and there's a hard squeezing pressure in your chest what would you do would you jump would you feel pity for yourself? Would you think about your family and your childhood and your dreams and all you're leaving behind? Would it hurt? Would it feel like dying? Would you cry as I did? Um, so again, putting you into the, uh, putting the reader into an uncomfortable situation um, where we were able to uh, remove ourselves from it. Now he's not letting us. I tried to swallow it back. I tried to smile, except I was crying. Now perhaps you can understand why I've never told this story before. It's not just the embarrassment of tears. That's part of it, doubt. But what embarrasses me much more, uh, and always will, is the paralysis that took my heart. So here we figure out what that embarrassment, that shame was. A moral freeze. I couldn't decide. I couldn't act. I couldn't comport myself with even the pretense of the modest human dignity. So we've got this verb now, couldn't, right? Um, and so he is finding that he is not being the human that he wants to be. All I could do was cry, quietly, not bawling, just the chest chokes. At the rear of the boat, Elroy Burdall pretended not to notice. So again, that silent um, support. He held a fishing rod in his hands, his head bowed to hide his eyes. He kept humming a soft, monotonous little tune. Everywhere, it seemed, in the trees and water and sky, a great worldwide sadness came pressing down on me, a crushing sorrow, sorrow like I'd never known it before. And what was so sad, I realized, was that Canada had become a pitiful fantasy. Um, so now he, he's almost, it seems like he's let go of it without even knowing that he's let go of it. Silly and hopeless. I, it was no longer a possibility. Right then, with the shore so close, I understood that I would not do what I should do. Um, and those conditionals, those are really important, that he would not do, um, which is will, right? Um, what he should do. I would not swim away from my hometown and my country and my life. I would not be brave. That old image of myself as a hero, as a man of conscience and courage, all that was just a threadbare pipe dream. So this idea of what does it mean to be brave, here he seems to say that brave, so we've got the idea of being brave and that bravery equals going to Canada, whereas bravery before, um, we might have thought about being brave enough to fight in the war. Um, he seems to be switching that idea of bravery um, and the idea of heroism. Um, this conscience and courage sometimes means running away. All that was just a threadbare pipe dream, bobbing there on the rainy river, looking back at the Minnesota shore. So now he's looking back. 
I felt a sudden swell of helplessness coming, come over me, a drowning sensation as if I had toppled overboard and was being swept away by the silver waves. Um, so there we've got that, uh, that idea of that fast current coming back. Chunks of my own history flashed by. I saw a seven-year-old boy in a white cowboy hat and a Lone Ranger mask and a pair of bolstered sh six shooters. So we've got, again, that hero image. And now we're going to go um, through a lot of allusions that I'm not going to stop and do any, um, any annotation for. I'm just going to read it. I saw a 12-year-old Little League shortstop pivoting to turn a double play. I, so this is his history, right? Um, I saw a 16-year-old kid decked out for his first prom, looking spiffy in a white tux and a black bow tie, his hair cut short and flat, his shoes freshly polished. Um, and so now it's he's depersonalizing. He's seeing a historical him as a different person. My whole life seemed to spill out into the river, swirling away from me, everything I'd ever been or ever wanted to be. I couldn't get my breath. I couldn't stay afloat. I couldn't tell which way to swim. So we've got that couldn'ts again. A hallucination, I suppose, but it was real as anything I would ever feel. I saw my parents calling me. So now we're going to get the anaphora of I saw. My parents calling to me from the far shoreline. I saw my brother and sister, all the townsfolk, the mayor and the chamber of commerce and all my old teachers and girlfriends and high school buddies. Like some outlandish sporting event. This goes back to that kind of Americana um, imagery. Everybody's screaming from the sidelines, rooting me on. A loud stadium roar, hot dogs and popcorn, stadium smells, stadium heat. A squad of cheerleaders did cartwheels along the banks of the rainy river. They had megaphones and pom-poms and smooth brown thighs. The crowd swayed left and right. A marching band played fight songs. My aunts and uncles were there, and Abraham Lincoln and St. George. So now we've moved away from the personal and into more historical illusion. And St. George and a nine-year-old girl named Linda who died of a brain tumor back in fifth grade and several members of the United States Senate and a blind poet scribbling notes and LBJ and Huck Finn and Abby Hoffman and all the dead soldiers back from the grave and the many thousands who, who were later to die, villagers with terrible burns, little kids without arms or legs. Yes, the Joint Chiefs of Staff were there and a couple of popes and a first lieutenant named Jimmy Cross and the last surviving veteran of the American Civil War and Jane Fonda dressed up as Barbarella, and an old man sprawled beside a, pig, beside a pig pen, and my grandfather and Gary Cooper and a kind-faced woman carrying an umbrella and a copy of Plato's Republic, and a million ferocious citizens waving flags of all shapes and colors, people in hard hats, people in headbands. They were all whooping and chanting, urging me toward one shore or the other. So we've got this idea um, of a river, and we've got like stands on either side with people cheering him, to go to one side or the other. So that's what you're going to be thinking about is like, who is cheering for which direction? My wife was there. My unborn daughter waved at me. My two sons hopped up and down and a drill sergeant named Blight and sneered and shot a finger, shot up a finger and shook his head. There was a choir in bright, bright purple robes. There was a cabbie from the Bronx. There was a slim young man I would one day kill with a hand grenade along the red, uh, red clay trail outside the village of Mike Kay. The little aluminum boat rocked softly beneath me. There was wind and uh, there was the wind in the sky. I tried to will myself overboard. I gripped the edge of the boat and leaned forward and thought, "Now, I did try. It just wasn't possible." Um, so the attempt, but a failed attempt, um, to do what he thinks is right. All those eyes on me. Um, so again, the eyes uh, leading to shame. The whole universe, the town, the whole universe, I couldn't risk the embarrassment. It was as if there were an audience to my life, that swirl of faces along the river. And in my head, I could hear the people, hear people screaming at me. Traitor, they yelled. Turncoat, pussy. I felt myself blush. I couldn't tolerate it. I couldn't endure the mockery or the disgrace or the patriotic ridicule. You might notice some of this from the first chapter uh, of the things they carried. The idea of uh, we di uh, people died because they were too embarrassed not to. Um, even in my imagination, the shore just 20 yards away, I couldn't make myself be brave. Um, and so again, that the idea of going is brave. It had nothing to do with morality, embarrassment. That's all it was. And right then, I submitted. So here, this equals failure, right? I submitted to something rather than doing something. I would go to the war. I would kill and maybe die because I was embarrassed not to. 
That was the sad thing. And I sat in the bow and uh, bow of the boat and cried. It was loud now, loud, hard crying. Elroy Burdell remained quiet. He kept fishing. So he has an audience. He's got somebody who's, who's silently supporting whatever he's doing. Um, he worked his line with the tips of his fingers, patiently squinting at his red and white uh, bobber on the rainy river. His eyes were flat and impassive. He didn't speak. He was simply there like the river in the late summer sun, and yet by his president, presence, his mute watchfulness, he made it real. He was the true audience. He was a witness, like God, or the God, or like the gods. So we've got some more of that uh, illusion, some more of that uh, God imagery. Who, in, who look on in absolute silence as we live our lives, as we make our choices or fail to make them. Um, and so here, there's, this is p- passiveness. Um, it's not that he's made a choice to go back home. It's that he's failed to make the choice to go somewhere else. Ain't biting, he said. So here, this is a double entendre, right? Um, he's talking both about the fish and about the kind of lure that he's put out for Tim O'Brien. Then after a time, the old man pulled in his line and turned the boat back toward Minnesota. I don't remember saying goodbye. That last night we had dinner together and I went to bed early and in the morning, Elroy fixed breakfast for me. When I told him I'd be leaving, the old man nodded as if he already knew. He looked down the table and he looked down at the table and smiled. Um, so, so you notice that he's not judging and um, he's just, he's letting, letting him be and letting him make the decision. At some point later in the morning, it's possible that we shook hands. I don't remember. But I do know that by the time I'd finished packing, the old man had disappeared. So again, letting him leave without uh, embarrassment, uh, not being somebody who's, who's judging and making, uh, and making things harder. Around noon, when I took my suitcase out to the car, I noticed that his old black pickup was no longer parked in front of the main lodge. I went inside and waited for a while, and, uh, but I felt a bone certainty that he wouldn't be back. In a way, I thought it was appropriate. I washed up the breakfast dishes, left his $200 on the kitchen counter, got into the car and drove south toward home. The day was cloudy. I passed through towns with familiar names, through the pine forests and down to the prairie, and then to Vietnam, where I was a soldier, and then home again. I survived, but it was not a happy ending. I was a coward. I went to the war. And so we're ending with those really concrete declarative sentences um, that kind of sum up the whole decision-making process.